Um, okay, so today I am joined by John Abel, who is the technical director in the CTO's office at Google Cloud, and Matt Randall, who is the head of finance, regulatory, and climate change at NatWest, to talk about the role that geospatial can play in helping organizations meet their climate reporting obligations and in reducing carbon footprints. So John, let's start with you. Can you talk me through the relationship between data and climate reporting obligations, um, risk reduction, resilience, especially focusing on geospatial data? Yeah, no problem at all. First of all, great seeing so many people. It was going to be a train strike today, so thank you for coming. <laughs> um, and thanks for the provocative questions. It should be quite good in the Q&A part. Uh, so let's talk about the, the answer to this. I think there's two roles of data. Well, there's maybe three roles. Uh, the first is validation. And, and this is immutable, what sometimes people relate to some other technologies, but an immutable way of actually making sure what you're saying is actually the truth and having it third party ratified. The second piece, which is important, is giving new insights. The challenge with a lot of the work I do in sustainability, I'm doing it on such a scale, like if I'm looking at the European forest mass, there's not enough humans to be able to give me the data I need. So we're using technology to enable us to enrich what we do know and actually give new insights through that at what we would typically call planet scale. So then, Matt, coming to you, how has NatWest started to use data in the work that you're doing? What have you found? What have you really seen come out of, of doing that? Yeah, so from a NatWest perspective, it's, it's, it's quite a benefit, actually, because they're very purpose-led, and climate is in the heart. And I saw on, on these speakers before that you know, climate it plays a real big part in the priorities and strategy. So from a, uh, I look after all the change from a regulatory perspective into the disclosures, into finance reports. So I took on, uh, it was a gift, actually. We took on the EU Parliament kicked out a load of taxonomies, which is just a series of questions. But the problem I was saying to the team is that my interpretation of those taxonomies means you've got RMs that are constantly going out across the network under tremendous pressure to gather more information. Taxonomy, for example, on, on just simply the agriculture sector means a thousand more questions that you need to ask the farmers, you need to ask the supply chain uh, to get going. So I was saying to the team, there must be a way that we could try and accelerate through the use of technology or through the generation of, of data through into that taxonomy status. Um, through, well, you know, NatWest Markets have got a, uh, a deal with Google to look at the infrastructure. And I just got chatting and I got a demonstration on the geospatial capabilities uh, of the satellite imagery coming through. And we just came up with an idea and we thought, right, let's test it. Let's test that idea, see how we can leverage geospatial to try and accelerate the, the answers in those taxonomy. So we chose agriculture, because that's the hardest one. It's coming in the future. Uh, and we got testing. Is, does this align with what you're seeing other companies trialing in terms of using data, especially geospatial data? Yeah, I think when we're looking at geospatial, if you think about climate r risk, if I was here at an insurance company, I'd talk about the 11 or 15 perils of insurance. and we typically think of wildfires, the things we physically see. The one that actually is the one that a lot of people focus on is heat. Heat is probably one of the biggest challenges because it causes you to not only have mitigation of carbon release, but you also have adaptation. And one of the things we're starting to see is how business are having to adapt. And actually, the reason why is upstream, especially in supply chains like farmers or in anything that's a physical resource, people are now having to adapt how they, first of all, reduce the carbon emissions, but more importantly, how they have to adapt their supply chain to make sure they don't have supply loss. And so we're seeing each industry is working slightly different ways, but they are using data sets to understand where to focus on, first of all, against different parts of the ecosystem. And this is way before, uh, way ahead of things like carbon greenhouse emissions like scope one, two, and three. This is actually looking at how they have a sustainable business, because you can do both. You can adapt and you can be sustainable. So in bringing this data into your, your process and your attempt to deal with these taxonomies, how, how successful have you been? What have the challenges be, been? And what have you seen as the real success points so far? Yeah, so from a challenging perspective, so we, we first looked at, so satellite data is very flat. 
I think the, the absolute key we realized quite early on in the sprints is to really start to link it through. So, for example, agriculture is a series of questions that we need to ask the farmers. So Farmer John, for example, we need to knock on his door. And the RM's thinking, oh, my goodness, you, you've given me an arming me with a thousand more questions. You know, we're already overflowed with those sort of questions. So we took the, the geospatial data and we started to link public and private data. And through the power of, of Google Earth or Earth Engine and Climate Engine, we started to link, for example, land registry data to the satellite images. So you've got flood data, you've got heat data, you've got emissions data. You can even go down to sort of looking at sort of the, you know, the fertilizer types, the crop cycles. But you have to link it. And you also have to ratify that data. So what we started to do was to bring in land registry data, other types of public forms to try and link to a postcode. I didn't take it further to then link to our customer repositories because I'd probably be there for a long time. All I wanted to do was to test how I could hone in on a holding, particular holding, by postcode, and see how much I can populate of those sector questions. And I think from a success perspective, I think we managed to get over 50% answered using geospatial and other types of public sector information to bring it in. But the, the biggest success I saw, and I guess this comes from the sort of the power of Earth, Earth Engine and Climate Engine, is the ability through AI, and this is the most exciting part, because it starts to enhance that customer journey, is being able to use that data on that holding to go back 10 years. You know, start to use the power of how to crunch that data to pr produce analytics on crop cycles. So you're already knocking on the door of Farmer John's holding to say, I, I get what you've got, I, I see where you've been for 10 years, I see to date what you've got today, but also using the power of AI, you can start to predict and start to project and layer on those sort of risk type, flood risk, fire risk, other types of hazards um, to, I just guess, enrich that customer journey. John, how have you seen other sectors use this as well? Clearly we're speaking about NatWest and, and um, Matt has spent a lot of time speaking through kind of how this works in the agriculture sector. But how have you seen this brought in out to, to other yeah. industries, et cetera? I think there's some good examples out there. Obviously, one of the companies that we work with is like Unilever looking at palm oil and actually understanding that. And we understand through that w what is the deforestation link to palm oil extraction of the... That's some projects we're doing. Project Sunroof, the ability of actually calculating the, the efficiencies you get from solar panels on roofs of buildings, including commercial buildings. The, in scope three emissions, what can we actually, scope three is probably the biggest challenge, if any, there's probably world authorities in here, so I'm not gonna make it too, um, but that one is super tricky, because you really wanna have ground source, you know, if you're using LCA or spend analysis. So we're trying to retrofit uh, scope three data through satellite imaging. And when we talk about satellite imaging being flat, there are actually satellites like ISAT-2, which allows us to have an angle attack, which means we can work out canopy height of carbon sequentation of a, of a forest. So there's many different projects that we're seeing across it. And I think that we're at the start of this. We're certainly not at the end of it. Um, and so, so kind of one of the things Matt mentioned is the need to link different types of data. How are you and other organizations that are creating data working together to kind of push the needle on this, this new approach to dealing with? Well, data partnerships will become critical. In, in, and I think actually going forward, it will be more critical than even some of the commercial partnerships. Because if we don't have data relationships or data sharing, we're actually going to be starved of insight. And one of the things that we, we have a luxury in like Google Earth Engine having like 700 data sets, and there's another uh, place you can go to, which is Kaggle, which is the biggest community of data scientists. But actually, one of the things that we really do need is more private data sets that allow insight to be collaborative between, like for all the work we're doing together. Mm. We, you need to have a, a horizontal lens of data, not a vertical data set. And the biggest challenge we have is to know how to create that in a way that people are willing to share data securely and with trust. That's probably the biggest barriers uh, of where we need to go next. Matt, I have kind of two follow-up questions for you. The first is around how is this received outside of the, the section of NatWest that you're working in that is focused on climate and regulation? 
And secondly, where do you hope to go next using this data? What do you see as a vision for how you continue to integrate this into your organization? So from a regulatory perspective on the taxonomy reform, I, I need to build the, the data foundations, the data meshes, and this is where I'm starting to look to leverage those data sets through to start to produce those reports, or at least those data sets that we can store and show the regulator or the EU parliament that we, you know, we're storing, capturing. Uh, that status information. But where does it go? I mean, I, I guess from an, an experiment perspective, huge success because the success really is showing us that there's huge opportunity to expand and grow sort of that customer experience. You know, you're arming with huge amounts of information that, you know, the farmer just doesn't understand, does, doesn't even know, you know, how to tap into unfunded grants, for example, from a DEFRA perspective. Are they aware that they could do this? It, it, just, it just enriches the, the RM to just have that more sort of credible conversation to take that sort of farmer onto sort of different journeys that obviously ultimately reduce their emissions, ultimately sort of get them sort of more socially responsive to that climate challenge. Uh, so there's, there's huge opportunity and it's just going to grow. Um, and I guess, John, if you're thinking about, if you're a business sitting in this room, and you're thinking about the viability of starting to incorporate this type of data into what you're doing. Realistically, is it something that every size organization is able to do? What do you think the, the kind of cost benefit implications might be to doing this? How do you see this kind of journey unfolding? And what are the questions that you would be asking if you were sitting in the room thinking about this today? What I advise everybody to do is think about education. Education is the first job, not going to the hard stuff, but just informing people. I'll give you an example. Um, one of the people in here from Google is called Charlotte. She's at the stand. Go and spend time with Charlotte. Just ask for Charlotte. She's dreading now I've said that. <laughs> but one of the reasons I raised that is we did some work looking at just the, car the embodied carbons of a desktop PC versus a laptop. And a desktop PC in the lifetime of that product has got the equivalent of driving 8,000 miles in a car. Now, if I turn up to a layperson and say, hey, it's got 3,500 kilos of carbon emissions. They go, whatever. If I turn up and say it's equivalent to driving 11, you know, 8,000 miles in a car versus like a Chromebook or a Mac, which has got 130 kilos, they may make a choice of not purchasing that desktop and actually purchasing a laptop. So it's just through insight and education you start. You don't want to start with something big. Because when people realize some of the impacts through just explaining it in a simple term, the challenge in the industry, we love technical terms. We love making it complex. Mm. The world is not, it's complex as a world, but people want it to be very simply given to them so they understand it. And I think we start with education. Yeah. So I think then, let's move to questions from the, the audience here. Um, does, is there anyone in the room who has a question for our panelists here? Don't be shy, otherwise submit them on oh, the Oh, there's a hand the over screen. there. Go for it. Please sh scream loudly. Well, no, there's a mic. Come on. Otherwise, you'll break your voice. <laughs> the light's shining in my eyes. Yeah, I, I know. You were just... <laughs> Go for um, it. You talked about the importance of uh, sharing, but you're also making an investment in purchasing the data and then linking it. Um, so my question to um, the person from NetWest is how much uh, is your willingness to share the data that you've created um, on farmer land, for example? Well, so the majority of that data that we're pulling through is, is public access data. So you could go and get that data today. Uh, but the, to me, the clever part in what NetWest is creating is how to link that data together to an outcome, to a, a future service or a customer offering, and also an educational step as well. Yeah, most data is out there. I think, most, yeah. I think you've been surprised by how much data. I think it's a great question about education. We've, we have a role at Google to, you know, one of our mission statements is making information university accessible. And we've got to do it in the sense of sustainability as well. So, so a lot of the data that you is available, it's just knowing where it is. And that's the biggest challenge, that we've got to make a low bar for access. And it's not PII data, by the way. It's not about people. A lot of sustainability has nothing to do with PII. Go ahead. Hi, just a quick question for Google. Um, basically, are the data that you have 
compiled over the years or um, is that readily available to the public? Yeah, so if you want like what I call, I mean, when Google Earth Engine exa example started, a lot of it was used for research, so I use it mostly for research. But it's actually there available, just type in Google Earth Engine. And actually, you don't need to be a developer. There's already many examples of very short snippets of code that will actually get you insight. And actually, it's like you know, understanding what's happened with forests and deforestation, understanding what's happening with heat and fire, wildfires. That data set there is available. There's about 700. It's it's quite a few petabytes of data. Just go on there and use it. You don't need to have a. You don't even need to speak to a Googler. Hi, hi. Um, I am I'm co-founder of a venture studio in circular economy startups and. What you've just said is really, really helpful. One of the challenges we have with startups is capacity and time. Um, and how do we actually get some of that data down to these innovators that are trying to disrupt in a really helpful way? Because I could put one of my co-founders or founders on this for a couple of months, and they might get some really good stuff out of it, but they might actually then miss the innovation. Do you want me to have a? Yeah, so just on that one, um, first of all, I always say to founders, be very clear on what you want to be famous for. The challenge a lot of founders do is they try to build the entire thing themselves because they have to own it. Well, first of all, don't try and own everything. There's no point. So be very clear on what you want. The second is there is incredible programs out there for sustainability startups. We've got one at Google, majority of the hyperscalers. Remember, we've got an agenda at Google by 2030 to be net zero. Now, the way we can do that is by helping the ecosystem of startups to effectively not create carbon gas emissions. So actually, you're helping us as we are helping you. That's the same with every other technology company. So find the programs that will help them get there. There's many out there. They don't, and if, you know, again, the Googlers are out there. I saw the few of the other uh, vendors out there. Go and talk to them. They've all got programs. But to add to that, they love a challenge. So where are we go in with a test mindset or an experimental mindset, they do enjoy that. And they need money. They're a bunch of scientists. And they need your money. <laughs> <laughs> One more question, and then we will invite all of you to a coffee break. So. Or a cup of tea. Or a cup of tea. Or water. Thank you. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Um, my question is related to data, and actually big data. We see more and more companies, yeah. actually every company, just focusing on maybe at first collecting data, not even knowing what to do with those, yeah. only later thinking about it. We are starting to realize how much that costs in terms of carbon emissions. Shouldn't we change a bit the notion around big data and just this collection of data at all costs? Yeah, I, I'll pick this one up as well. <laughs> <laughs> You've got the big data. Space, yeah, so we? first of all, around data, it's the same as the startup ecosystem. You don't need all the data, yeah? Example would be CVs, CVs. You, you could actually create the corpus of a human that you're going to employ through just pr public data, where they've spoken, what universities they went to, what's their LinkedIn profile. Do you need a CV? So think about, in the future, of giving up data as well. And we're a data company, and that's like me saying give up data. It's OK to give up some data. You know, don't go and delete all your corporate records for auditing. Uh, that's not what I'm saying. But think about the data you need. Think about the data you need. The second is, um, when you're dealing with very high volumes of data, you're seeing a big shift in the technology industry where we're going to carbon-free energy in a lot of our data centers globally. We have to do it for our own net zero agenda. Also, think about those placements of data. And also think about the technology and how your data scientists are using it. You know, and again, we, are, we have got a sustainable developer guide coming out called Green Ops. And you know, we have experts on our stand uh, that you can talk to about what we're doing to educate people on technology usage to make a difference. So I think, there's, there's, again, it's about education. Uh, and certainly around data, you don't always need everything that you've got. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, John. And we invite all of you to the networking break and hope to see you back here later. Thanks.